Hi, everybody. This is Lee Greenwood. I am the uh, Forest Health Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. Um, this is the third time that I've given this specific webinar uh, in three years. The first time I did it, everybody really felt like it was useful, so I have updated it and redone it. Now, this will be the third time. Um, I do want to emphasize that if you have an urgent correction or comment on a slide that I'm working on or talking about, please put it in the chat box. I will see it. Um, and if I think it needs to be brought out to the group or if you clearly have a correction for me, um, then I will sort of work with it right in real time. The reason I mention that is because we're going to be covering um, some fairly absurd amount of ground in the next 45 minutes. Hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, and it's going to incorporate uh, rules and regulations across all 50 states, um, as well as all of Canada and over 14 different regulated pests. So it is likely, in fact, that you may find that I have made a mistake, um, and in which case I would love to know about it so we can correct it immediately. So before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you to the um, NASMA folks, Molly and Bell, as well as just in general to the hosts of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, this webinar is part is co-hosted essentially. Um, this is prepared for the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative, which is an initiative that I run. And um, this is an outstanding platform to make sure that the most possible people see this webinar. So before we begin, let's start by talking a little bit of vocabulary. Um, this slide is really interesting right now because uh, the you know world news is really uh, focusing on the coronavirus, which is obviously a human health threat. But we've been talking a lot in uh, the world about quarantines as a result of that current issue. And quarantines actually come in two different types. And um, one type is the type that is called an external quarantine. An external quarantine keeps something bad out of a defined area that you wish to protect. So you're protecting the, the area without the bad thing from harm. That would be the sort of thing in the case of uh, a human virus where you said no visitors could come into a country no matter where those visitors are from because all you're doing is just trying to protect the country. Now, there's also something called an internal quarantine. That's what people usually first think of as a quarantine. That's like the traditional kind of quarantine that your brain goes to in terms of like a human disease that's an old type, like a leprosy or something like that. And also an internal quarantine is what they did to the folks on those um, cruise ships for the virus where they would not let them leave the ship because that is they are isolating what they perceive as the bad thing into a defined already infested area to prevent the further spread of that bad thing past the limit. So throughout the course of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about external quarantines, which protect an uninfested area that is well-defined, and internal quarantines, which are keeping something in a very restricted area to prevent it from getting out. So they're sort of the two sides of a coin. If I just say quarantine, I apologize because they are extremely different. So I will try to always say which type I'm referring to. A regulated item is another piece of jargon that I wanted to define. A regulated item is basically anything that can serve as a carrier for the problem you're worried about. So in the course of this presentation, I will talk about how regulated items cannot cross quarantine boundaries um, without some sort of treatment or inspection or certification. And furthermore, I will usually be talking about firewood, because this is a firewood regulation webinar, as a regulated item. But it's really worth noting that for nearly every pest that I will be talking about, firewood is not the only regulated item for a regulated pest. So, um, you know, an easy example of this would be for gypsy moth. Um, firewood is one of many, many, many regulated items because gypsy moth can lay its eggs on everything from a wheelbarrow to a garden gnome to a piece of firewood. So in that case, the regulated items are very, very broad, not just firewood, but firewood is one of them. 
Now here's a chart that will probably make you regret that you joined this webinar briefly, but what I wanted to illustrate is that there are three different 2012 PPQ treatment manual codes for the heat treatment of wood. That's that center column. And we often talk about heat treatment as one monolithic thing, but actually there's the three different core types of heat treatment. They have nicknames that we all kind of use in order to make sure that we're talking about the same thing, but you know, the nicknames are informal. I've listed them for reference. That's under the shorthand column. So there's one is a lower heat treatment. That's called the universal heat treatment. That's that top one. That applies to things like gypsy moth um, and certain situations like the solid wood packaging standard. Then there's the middle standard, which is the one that emerald ash borer um, quarantine lines in either directions um, it applies to. Um, and people call that the emerald ash borer standard, but that's not its name. That's just how we sort of shorthand call it. And then there's the bottom one, which is the hottest. That's um, often called the Asian longhorn beetle standard, but that's not a very good name either because it was once proposed to have a different standard for that insect. Um, so basically that's just the highest standard. I'm not actually gonna talk a lot about the different heat treatment standards for the rest of the presentation, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that typically speaking for all of the different rules and regulations that we're gonna be talking about one of these three heat treatment standards would apply. It's gonna vary according to the pest and the regulatory authority and the intent, but it should be one of the three. Okay, so first time I ever made this presentation, I was really struggling to figure out how to divide up the world. And I, um, I live in Montana, so we like the word wrangler and wrangle. And so I said, okay, well, if we just look at the biggest picture of all the different regulations that apply to firewood, you can sort of wrangle them roughly into a couple broad categories and then go from there to understand the bigger picture. So here is my attempt to wrangle. Um, we have three different types at large. There are pest driven regulations. Those can be divided into two different universes, things that are US federally regulated pests or pests of concern that are currently not federally regulated by the US government. Then we've got spatially drawn regulations. So these are, um, you can think of them as biologically arbitrary, but legally important regulations because you know pests don't respect the difference between one state and another, for instance, or one country and another. And those spatially drawn regulations are drawn according to international boundaries individual state borders, land owning entities that are not states nor countries, and less than state sized geographic boundaries. We'll get into all of those. So there's four different types there. Last but not least, there are some, but not many, distance from origin based regulations that define the movement of firewood as being legal or illegal according to how far you are moving it from the point of origin, from the tree it was cut from. So let's dive in. For the first grouping, pest-driven regulations that are through federally regulated pests, we have seven different pests that I'm going to outline that I think really illustrate the diversity of pests and um, issues that we're looking at. So first off, Asian longhorn beetle. This is a great new map put out by the National uh, Asian longhorn beetle program through USDA APHIS. Um, uh, the red boxes, show active regulated areas with an Asian longhorn beetle infestation that is currently on the landscape under an eradication program. You cannot move firewood or anything else out um, of a wood product that could potentially carry Asian longhorn beetle out of those red blobby areas. If you are colorblind, I realize you cannot tell the difference. So I will tell you that there is one in Ohio called Tate Township. There is one in central Long Island, New York, and there is one in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now there is a um, slight delay on the, or sorry, there's a slight timing error on this map. Um, this map was actually made literally a matter of days before a new tree was found within the existing infestation area in Worcester, Massachusetts. So um, here is my intentionally sloppy modification to this map. So that last detection was now in January, 2020. Firewood cannot leave these red blobby areas but they are very discrete small regions. And the firewood in the state at large, so for instance, the firewood throughout all of Ohio has a different 
rule or regulation than firewood within the very small red zone in Tate Township, for instance, in Ohio. So that's example one. Example two is a much broader issue, um, geographically speaking, which is the emerald ash borer. This is the current emerald ash borer quarantine, which is the blue thick line that is federally held, um, superimposed on top of the approximate range of ash trees throughout the contiguous United States. The pale green is all ash um, native to the landscape. The darker dotty green is high density ash. Uh, and the um, yellow, which is kind of hard to see, is ash planted in cities or urban landscape ash. Now, what's interesting is that firewood cannot leave the blue boundary um, without being appropriately heat treated. But um, the firewood is actually legally allowed to move within that large blue boundary. And right away, if you're trying to think about potential issues with this system, you can take a look at Georgia, South Carolina, and Southern North Carolina, and you'll see that there are some high density natural stands of ash. Um, those happen to be on an area called the Piedmont. It's kind of a dark green swoosh. Um, and they don't have any of the red for first point of infestation dots in the Piedmont, but it is actually in the quarantine, which means that you are legally not restricted from moving firewood out of the northern or western areas of those states into those infest, infest into those areas that lack an infestation right now, because the nature of this federal quarantine is that it can be drawn, although it does not have to be drawn, around an entire state, even if the state isn't fully infested. So, you know, if you look at the states like Kansas and Nebraska and stuff, they've they've really just carved out little corners where they have their only infestation and the federal boundary is real tight to those corners. But if you look at Georgia, you'll see a com or South Carolina, you'll see a completely different approach. So firewood from anywhere within this blue boundary right now can move to outside of the blue boundary. Um, and I did mention in the description of this webinar that there has been a um, proposal to remove essentially the blue boundary entirely from the United States. So that is the proposal to deregulate emerald ash borer. The ramification of that would be that the blue boundary goes away for this particular species um, and its firewood-based regu uh, regulations that affect firewood with under the authority of this particular species of the emerald ash borer. So that's the implication of that proposal. Now, um, that proposal was open for public comment in late 2018, um, and I have not heard at this time where that proposal will be going. I believe that is still an open question. So one thing that I wanted to mention when we look at this is, for instance, if you look up at the state of Maine, it's a very incomplete picture to look at it without the dots that represent the infestations in Canada as well. So Canada has its own regulated area, um, including one spot far to the west in Winnipeg in the province of Manitoba, as well as in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick all the way to the east. So the infestation of emerald ash borer and the related regulations on the movement of uh, regulated items such as firewood also include um, situations up in Canada. Next up, European gypsy moth. If you are from the generally infested area, which is kind of the bright red zone, um, you probably maybe didn't even realize how much of a concern this, are, this is, but European gypsy moth doesn't currently have infestations outside of this zone. So you are not allowed to move firewood outside of any of these brightly colored zones into the sort of tan, well, that's not even tan, it's like a pale green. Anyway, the Minnesota, Iowa, Kentucky, et cetera, uninfested um, states or regions. So this has a lower heat treatment standard, but firewood is not allowed to move, be moved from inside this area to outside this area. Changes that occurred recently include the fact that you can note that the top of Maine is now light green. That means that in 2019, the rule changed and now firewood um, and any other regulated item for European gypsy moth can be moved from Southern Maine into Northern Maine. But um, in the opposite, that also means that 
firewood cannot be moved from northern Maine into, say, Kentucky, which, mind you, would be a little bit ridiculous, but like that's the implication of that regulatory change that now that all of Maine is within the European Gypsy Moth Quarantine, you can't move stuff in or out depending on, um, or you can't move stuff out depending on where you are from. So that's Gypsy Moth. And again, if anybody has questions or um, thinks I'm making a mistake, I really urge you to reach out via chat. I'll see the message and I'll self-correct or whatever needs to happen. Going to a whole other section of the country, there is a pest, um, very, very uh, damaging invasive species called the um, giant African land snail. Um, and the giant African land snail can be on any type of firewood. Um, and it is only affecting a very small region in the greater Miami area. Um, thank goodness. In the last year, they, so the regulation for giant African land snail is very, very specific, like tiny neighborhoods within the greater Miami area. And so um, last year, they actually eradicated four of the little tiny neighborhoods, and there are only nine remaining now of giant African land snail. So I do see one question, which is great. It says, is it just ash firewood or all firewood that is restricted? That's highly dependent on the situation. Specifically for emerald ash borer, it's all firewood because of the extreme difficulty of telling apart species of firewood in a mixed load. Therefore, realistically speaking, um, the, the ability to just regulate ash firewood is just completely not feasible. Certain states that I'll get to later don't use this rule and they will regulate a certain hardwood type or all hardwoods or all one species or whatever. Um, so it's basically the real answer is it's all over the map according to what the specific regulation is dictating. For giant African land snail, it would be anything at all that a snail could um, shelter in, for instance. But so it's going to depend on every single situation. Um, Let's see, next up, pine shoot beetle. This is a great um, illustration of the complexity here. Pine shoot beetle is a pest of pines. And in fact, pine firewood is not allowed to leave this bright red zone or pink zone, um, just like we talked about for emerald ash borer. You know, you would, in theory, need to not move ash trees, but because of the complexity of that particular species in the firewood market, it's a, a broader restriction. So um, right now, pine shoot beetle is also under a potential deregulation process. Um, it was proposed in late 2019 uh, and open for public comment. And to the best of my knowledge, no action has been taken to deregulate pine shoot beetle either. But that would eliminate this particular regulation as well if that goes forward. Imported fire ant is an interesting one for a lot of for all the prior. Um, Regula regulations, um, firewood is a very straightforward potential vector of the particular insect that I, or, or in the case of snail, the snails. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you would not move firewood out. But for imported fire ant, firewood actually is not listed in the list of regulatory items by name. However, because anything that is stored on um, plain soil or dirt is potentially regulated, it is possible for imported fire ant, that firewood stored uh, um, on plain soil on the ground would actually be a regulated item. And in which case you would not be able to take firewood that had been stored on the ground from this zone out of it. So into any of those uninfested gray counties in Texas or um, anywhere basically north of that line or the various different areas around California that are infested anywhere outside those areas in California. Um, I have heard anecdotally that some of the infestations in Tennessee specifically were first found in campgrounds. They are not sure if that was because of contaminated firewood or contaminated large house plants because fire ants can get up through the drainage holes of house plants that have been placed, or not house plants, but like landscaping plants that you move with an RV. Um, so it definitely, the, this pest definitely could potentially be moving um, in situations, especially if you pick up the firewood when it's very, very cold early in the morning. So the ants are dormant and they don't bite you. It would actually not be that difficult to accidentally move firewood in this way, excuse me, accidentally move imported fire ant this way. But again, it's not specifically one of the regulated items called out in the imported fire ant quarantine. Another one that's kind of similar actually is the um, sudden oak 
is sort, sort of similar to imported fire ant is sudden oak deaths quarantine. You're not allowed to move potentially contaminated host species of sudden oak death um, host trees out of the red and orange zones on this map, um, orange stripey being up in Oregon and the reddish pink being in California. Um, but the reality is that it's not extremely likely that firewood would spread this pest unless it was potentially contaminated with um, contaminated soil. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation because firewood actually is one of the regulated items, but the science is, is as I understand it, fairly unclear as to whether you know, clean, dry firewood actually could move sudden oak death. It would be more likely to be um, sort of a dirty, wet firewood that actually would be capable of moving this pest out of here. But regardless, sudden oak death has firewood listed as a regulated item, and therefore you cannot move firewood from this area outside of this area. So um, those were all of the federally regulated forest insects and diseases, as well as in the case of um, fire ant and giant African land snail, just sort of landscape issues. Um, now we're going to get into the pests of concern that are not federally regulated at all. These are actually regulated um, by other independent groups, and we'll get into that in just a second here. So the first one that I want to get into is mountain pine beetle. The state of Minnesota has extensive, awesome northeastern pines um, that have no desire to be attacked by the mountain pine beetle, and therefore they have put uh, regulation on the native, not non-native, the native pests of pine, mountain pine beetle, that's MBP on the map. Um, that's the red and the blue zones, and no materials made out of pine can be moved from the red or blue zones into the state of Minnesota. So they have a external quarantine prohibiting the entrance of, of materials into Minnesota to protect their pine. Now on this map, you actually see the bottom arrow is the likely movement of um, materials in commercial um, operations. So for instance, firewood. The top arcing arrow is the potential movement of mountain pine beetle um, by its own means over time in a climate change scenario, which is a really interesting map. But we're not going to talk about that right now. We're just talking about firewood. So that bottom arrow is how the unintentional movement of mountain pine beetle into Minnesota is a threat and could bring, um, and therefore they have an external regulation to prevent it. Next up, we take a long trip over to Hawaii. So on your left is Kauai, which is a small Western island in the Hawaiian island archipelago. Um, it has three current locations of two different species of highly destructive fungus. And then on the right, they have one species and um, lots of different years. That's the color scheme. On the island of Hawaii, which is the largest of the Hawaiian islands, um, the pest here is this highly damaging killer fungus called rapid ohia death. And you are not allowed to move any firewood or any other wood material off of the island of Hawaii onto any of the other islands. Um, and that is essentially an, uh, the internal quarantine to make sure that materials stay on the island of Hawaii, that, that the island of Hawaii doesn't make the rest of the Hawaiian islands, and excuse the terminology here with Hawaiian islands, it's really confusing, but it doesn't make all the other ones, so Maui and, and more of Kauai or anything like that, contaminated with the current disease that is on the island of Hawaii itself. Um, so that is a regulation put in place by the, I believe it's the Hawaiian Department of Agriculture holds that regulation, and it is to protect the other islands of the archipelago. Next up, we're going to head back on over to the continental United States and look at spotted lanternfly. This is a really interesting map of spotted lanternfly. And let me just take a minute to define what all the colors are, because they're kind of confusing. And actually, last year when I did this, I defined the colors wrong, and I want to correct my error. So the blue areas are areas that specifically New York has decided you cannot move materials into New York State from 
So that is a very specific designation. This map is put out by the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, which is run through Cornell. So it's got a very New York bent. The areas outlined by red are the areas that each individual state has isolated from themselves. So for instance, the areas that are outlined in red in New Jersey are the parts that New Jersey says you cannot move materials, including firewood, out of the red zone into the other parts of New Jersey. Likewise, in Pennsylvania, you got your blue spots that are outlined in red. You can't move those anything from those areas in Pennsylvania to the rest of Pennsylvania, et cetera. Now, it's worth noting that all the little orange dots or orange counties um, have a designation of spotted lanternfly has been found, but there is no infestation. That often means a dead or a single live individual and no additional um, issues have been found. And so it could be something as simple as like, you know, one died and fell into your car and then you drove and opened the door. It's still dead, it never didn't do any harm. And they do see these, especially in warehouses and other environments. Um, and that's what those orange blocks are. So they are not current infestations. Um, and then some of the blue blocks, uh, the text is a little bit difficult to read, but some of the blue blocks like in Northern Virginia and Eastern West Virginia are not outlined in red. And that is because even though New York, hence the blue color, does not want materials from there entering the state of New York, the um, particular state of orange, such as West Virginia, or state of origin, such as West Virginia, has not quarantined that area yet. So this is a very complicated map and I apologize. Firewood cannot move largely out of any of the areas outlined in either red or blue, but the exact legal definition of each of those regions varies according to what state they're in and what state is the receiving state according to the laws of the receiving state. That is the same map from last year's presentation on your left. So you can see that in one year, we added essentially likely a dead fly in um, North Carolina, that's that far south point, and um, some uh, one or more dead flies found, uh, spotted lantern flies found in Massachusetts. Um, there's more spots in the map. The West Virginia is added to the map, et cetera. So spotted lanternfly is a situation that is changing significantly throughout each year. And I thought it would be good to um, provide a perspective on how the situation has changed. You can also note that New Jersey has really expanded a lot of its um, blue counties, which are the ones that New York will not receive goods from. Totally different pest, thousand cankers disease of walnut, which is a fungus that is moved around by the actions of the walnut twig beetle. Um, the thousand cankers disease is confirmed in all the states that are in prison stripes, and there is a quarantine issued by the state authority of all of the states that are tan. Now, it might strike you as weird that some of the states on the east side of the continent um, have an external quarantine with respect to the thousand cankers disease and yet they also have a confirmed presence of thousand cankers disease and that would be weirder if you didn't understand that actually the pr confirmed presence of thousand cankers disease in those states is fairly isolated typically in one or two cities and so they do not want additional widespread importation of contaminated materials such as firewood with thousand cankers disease there's two different types of quarantines that have been chosen by each state's individual you know, desires and needs and politics. One, generally speaking, is to prohibit all hardwood firewood from the confirmed thousand cankers disease infested states. So for instance, a state in the east might prohibit all hardwood firewood from all the states that are in the stripes on the west. Some states, however, got a lot more specific and they only prohibit firewood and other woody materials of the genus of walnut, which is juglans. Um, so only juglans-based genus wood is prohibited in those cases. Now there are some states, we'll get to this, that only prohibit that, and that's their only firewood external quarantine that they have on the record. But that's not um, typical, even though it does exist in a few states in this case. All right, so we've made it through all of our pest-driven regulations. That's the hardest part, and thank goodness, because I've only got 15 minutes left before I wanna get started on questions. <laughs> 
So then we get into spatially drawn regulations. We're going to start with the biggest and probably the simplest to explain, which is the international boundaries um, regulations. Canada um, is to our north largely, and there are regulations that uh, provide restrictions on moving firewood in either direction, either into the United States from a source in Canada, which is uh, the regulations are created by USDA APHIS, and, which is Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and they are maintained by Customs and Border Protection at the border. Or if firewood is moving from the United States from a source in our country up into Canada, then the Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, writes the regulations, and they are maintained by the Canadian Border Services, I think that's administration, CBSA. Um, you can think of them as the Mounties if you're from the United States. So we have a reciprocal, although not identical, regulations in either U.S. to Canada or Canada to U.S. Uh, directions. We have essentially an exactly the same system for Mexico. So we have regulations going from Mexico up into the United States and from the United States down into Mexico. Um, in Mexico, it is uh, held by CONAFOR, which is their forestry administration. Now, for other countries, we have a standard that uh, all firewood that is entering the United States has to adhere to. Again, it's it's like the Canadian um, system in that the USDA APHIS, the, sorry, it's like our relationship with Canada in that material coming in is evaluated according to the regulations held by USDA APHIS and then um, actually on the ground performed by Customs and Border Protection. But it's important to note that the heat treatment regulations from other countries besides Canada and Mexico, I believe vary um, fairly significantly in terms of those three different heat treatment standards um, in terms of what is demanded of the firewood. So there's, it is not consistent between Canada, Mexico, and other countries when wood is entering the United States um, because different parts of the world have different threats. We obviously have land borders with Canada and Mexico, whereas we do not have land borders with the rest of the world. Individual states have the right and have exercised it to put in place their own external quarantines, preventing the entrance of firewood into their state without whatever particular treatment regulation they wish to put in place. And the states that currently, according to my very best fact checking, have this system are listed here. So I'll go through them one at a time. A comprehensive external quarantine means that absolutely no type of firewood um, so green, seasoned, hardwood, softwood, mixed load, whatever is allowed to enter the state unless it has um, been treated to fulfill the heat treatment requirements of the state regulation held by that state. So for instance, um, Florida holds the highest heat treatment regulation as its requirement for heat treatment. So fire, firewood cannot enter Florida unless it has been treated to a very high heat treatment standard. New Hampshire and Vermont, I believe, both maintain the center, the middle standard, which is the emerald ash borer colloquially standard. Um, and firewood cannot enter New Hampshire or Vermont without re without first being heat treated to that heat treatment standard. So those are those six states with comprehensive quarantines. Now then there's an additional four states that have what I have qualified as the not quite comprehensive external quarantine. So those that is California, Connecticut, Oregon, and Utah. They have fairly comprehensive quarantines, but there are significant exemptions from the heat treatment regulations. So for instance, with the state of Oregon, you can actually bring in not heat treated firewood from Idaho and Washington, there's an exemption. Um, for Utah, you can bring in not heat treatment, heat treated firewood at the um, discretion and evaluation of the state plant health director, I believe it is, or state plant regulatory official. Um, Connecticut, you can move firewood in from some adjacent states, but not other adjacent states. In California, their external quarantine is actually um, dictated by the specific pest likelihood of the origin of the firewood. And therefore, if there was an origin of firewood that was, you know, well outside of California, but was deemed to not have a regulated pest in the origin point, it would be allowed in. So it's not a comprehensive rule. You could, you could easily move firewood from, for instance, the center of the country into California. Um, if it was deemed appropriate by the state of California. So it's not a comprehensive system. Okay, those are the two types of external quarantines in the groups. So we've got six of the comprehensive ones and then four of the not comprehensive ones. Then we get into the thousand cankers disease rules that we looked at in the prior um, map based on pests. 
What's interesting is that with the states that have a thousand cankers disease oriented quarantine, a lot of them actually just regulate based on hardwood, firewood because of this difficulty that was brought up earlier of um, telling apart a mixed load of hardwoods with what is an ash tree, or in this case, what is a walnut tree piece of firewood once it's all been bucked and potentially even debarked versus what is something else. Um, it's pretty much close to impossible. And therefore, all these states, so Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, et cetera, um, actually list out hardwood instead of walnut for their external quarantines. So you can't move firewood from essentially most of the Western states into hardwood firewood, excuse me, from most of the Western states into these, generally speaking, um, central Great Lakes kind of states. There are, however, five states, that's Arkansas, Illinois, Kansas, Minnesota, and Virginia, that only regulate walnut, that's that Juglans spa um, firewood. And so that's a pretty limited exemption um, for, or that's a pretty limited regulation um, for that external quarantine. Last but not least, there are two states that have very specific, not already mentioned types of external quarantines. Um, Minnesota, actually I did already mention that, that's the mountain pine beetle quarantine for any area that it has mountain pine beetle potentially and therefore pine firewood from those areas are is prohibited by the nature of their state-based external quarantine. And Arizona has a pests of pecan quarantine, um, which is that pecan wood cannot enter the state of Arizona. They are trying to protect their um, pecan industry from potential attack because pecan is a tree and therefore firewood would threaten that uh, nut tree. Those are all of the state-based spatially drawn regulations of firewood. Next up, the landowning entity group. So we've got at least 12 different national parks, um, you know, Shannon, Shenandoah, Blue Ridge, Great Smoky being some of the sort of thought leadership on the issue of national parks banning external firewood. Um, we've got at least eight different national forests that ban the entrance of firewood. Those tend to be around the Great Lakes area. Um, we've got two districts that I know of within the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, for those not familiar with the Army Corps of Engineers in general, they own a ton of area around dams and artificial lakes and reservoirs. And with that, they own a lot of campgrounds for people who own RVs and boats and all sorts of other fun craft. Um, so they're actually a major entity in the world of landowning and campground running. Um, and so they do have several areas that have prohibited the entrance of firewood through that aspect of their existence. Now, the Bureau of Land Management is a totally different type of land owning entity within the federal government. Um, they don't have uh, the same type of campground um, sort of culture as some of the other ones. There's very few reservable, fee reservable campgrounds, so there's very little opportunity for banning of anything. Um, so while they do have recommendations not to move firewood into their lands, um, I do not know of any Bureau of Land Management unit that has a regulation for firewood. Moving past just the federal entities that own land, there are many tribal authorities, lands and reservations that can, and in some case have indeed restricted the entrance of firewood onto their lands. Um, I believe there's a few tribes in California that are considering that right now as a result of the polyphagous shot full borer and gold spotted oak borer, which are both pests of hardwood trees, um, as well as there's a number of different tribes in the greater Great Lakes region that have restricted the movement of firewood due to concerns of emerald ash borer. I believe there are also some tribes in the state of Maine that are considering or perhaps have banned the entrance of firewood onto their lands for the same reason. I was unable to find any conclusive rules um, that I would put, be comfortable listing tribal names um, on this presentation, but I can assure you that I've heard many a conversation about this phenomenon. And so tribes can and do restrict the entry of firewood in some cases. Sometimes uh, land owning entities within a state, such as a parks authority, will ban firewood from entering their parks. So I found six different examples of parks, um, both California state parks and certain county parks, which in some cases in California have more visitation than state parks authorities in other uh, states because California is so big. Um, 
the California state and county parks have regulations on firewood. Typically it's banning oak firewood, but sometimes it's banning all firewood for that simplicity of figuring out what exactly you're banning in a mixed load. Um, Kentucky and Tennessee allow only certified firewood to enter their state park lands. Wisconsin has a, has a really cool rule, I think. You can bring certified firewood or you can buy it if it was sourced within 10 miles of the park. That has really good biological scientific basis for it. Um, you know, many of these insects can fly. And so within 10 miles, you are not actually moving firewood farther than an insect might be able to move itself. Vermont State Parks currently has a prohibition on firewood from outside the state of Vermont. Um, I believe there is a exemption for firewood that is certified as heat treated, um, but I didn't see it, so I did not include it. Um, and then Virginia State Parks has, a, has had a policy in the past to confiscate untreated, unheat treated firewood from outside, um, from a emerald ash borer infested county. When I was fact checking this presentation, I was unable to find that in writing. Um, so I'm not sure if that policy is still in existence, but I know that it did used to exist. And so it may still be in existence. I was not able to scour all 50 different state parks entities um, uh, before this presentation. So I may have left a few out. Interestingly, there are a couple sort of fascinating examples of less than the state geographic boundary prohibitions on the movement of firewood. Um, Iowa and Wisconsin have an interesting rule where they prohibit the transport of emerald, of potentially infested firewood between emerald ash borer infested areas and uninfested counties between their two states. Um, I think that's really great because that means that they're both sort of um, reciprocally protecting each other's forests. And that's an interesting, um, unusual situation. As I mentioned before, uh, Hawaii is a series of islands and therefore um, the sort of isolation and internal quarantining of uh, the island of Hawaii to protect the rest of the islands of the Hawaiian island group is a less than state example. And then um, there is no emerald ash borer found in Park County, Wyoming, which is that sort of vaguely pink outlined zone in the northwest corner of Wyoming on the map up there. But interestingly, they have listed um, emerald ash borer in their Weed and Pest Control Act to allow them at any time to prohibit the entrance of potentially infested materials. Um, Yellowstone National Park is, is, has near complete overlap with Park County and it is obviously one of the highest visited national parks um, and therefore the tourism coming from emerald ash borer potentially infested areas is very significant. So they have this um, rule in place to allow them to prohibit firewood in the future at any time if they so want it um, through their Pest Control Act. So these are examples of less than state state geographic besides geographic boundary external quarantines. Um, I will note that this list used to be longer when I started this presentation two years ago. Um, we have fewer now of these examples. So some of these restrictions have been lifted. They don't exist anymore. So that is an interesting change. All right, last but not least, distance from origin regulations. In the state of New York, you're not allowed to move firewood more than 50 miles with, and um, if you are moving it at all, you have to create this self-certification form which you can print out off the internet. That is to um, protect areas such as the Adirondacks, which are largely not infested with emerald ash borer and therefore um, you know, 50 miles from the generally infested parts of New York, Southern and Western, um, it helps slow the spread towards those that large ecosystem in the um, north center of New York State, as well as other places. Florida has this really kind of interesting exemption where out-of-state firewood, which is prohibited in general, actually has a 50-mile gray zone up into Georgia um, and whatever state is west of Georgia that I can't remember. Um, and that way, if you are just going within 50 miles, which is a reasonable distance, you can use that exemption so that you're not violating the rule if you're visiting Florida. Um, Oregon has this exemption that is based on sort of a bioregional concept I talked about before, where firewood from Washington and Idaho is not subject to the heat treatment requirements in Oregon. Um, that's just because they think that Generally speaking, the issues found in the Washington and Idaho forests are going to be so similar to those things found in Oregon that there's no need to prohibit firewood from those two states. And then Wisconsin State Parks, as we mentioned before, has this heat treatment rule, or you can actually use firewood from within 10 miles, which again, I think is very practical 
Um, so these distance from origin regulations are very practical on the surface of them. The problem that um, I think kind of erupts from these types of regulations is that um, they present a confusing environment for the public. So when you're doing outreach, even though these are quite um, sort of scientifically and regulatory sound concepts, to actually communicate the sort of subtlety with the public, I think is really challenging. So um, that's one issue with the distance from origin regulations. Uh, so you're wondering, are you leaving out Canada? No, of course I'm not leaving out Canada. There's all sorts of Canadian pests that have quarantined regions as well, including Asian longhorn beetle, brown spruce longhorn beetle, which is found in Eastern Canada along the Maritimes, Dutch elm disease, which actually has not reached every single city in the prairies of um, Canada. So they still regulate it up there. Emerald ash borer, which we saw on the map earlier, gypsy moth, which is a problem in Eastern Canada and hemlock woolly adelgid, which likewise has not reached all the different um, potential habitats in, in Canada, nor has it in the United States. Hemlock willia adelgid actually does not move very, there's not a high likelihood of it being transported on firewood, but in Canada, it is a regulated item for hemlock willia adelgid, so it's worth noting. They also have, of course, the parallel system with international boundaries that we talked about before. Um, they have individual provincial laws, uh, specifically Saskatchewan and Alberta, which are prairie provinces, have sort of a reciprocal law, but not, not moving firewood between them. Um, they have a few national parks north of the Great Lakes that prohibit outside firewood, which is to um, slow the spread of emerald ash borer, if you ask those parks authorities. Um, and I was not able to find any less than province-sized ge geographic boundary examples within Canada, so nothing besides national parks, really. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, it simply means I could not find them. Likewise, with distance from origin regulations in Canada, if those do exist, I was unable to find them. So we look at this whole thing across the entire continent, and the complexity of this regulatory environment is really significant. Talking at maximum speed, it has taken me 48 minutes to get through all of them, and I didn't even really detail every single one of them. So I just wanted to show you, you know, we've got the US federal and Canadian federal and non-federal pests that comes out to 14 different pests that currently have regulations in place that either directly or notably indirectly do affect the movement of firewood. When we look at spatially drawn regulations, we have three different types of international boundary regulations. We have six types of external full quarantines for individual state borders, four types of external um, not complete quarantines for state borders, 17 different states that have a pest specific external quarantine, whether that's thousand cankers disease, pine beetle or pecan pests, two different provinces that have a um, external quarantine, that's that Saskatchewan and Alberta that I talked about a moment ago. Then we have three different federal land owning entities, an unknown number of tribes that have put in place firewood regulations and six different state park models that we see that um, restrict the movement of firewood entering a particular state park uh, grouping. Uh, and then we have three different types of less than state geographic boundaries. Again, that particular type of um, firewood regulation seems to be going out of favor, um, with the probable exception of Hawaii, because it's so practical to isolate an island. Uh, and then we have the four different states that have examples of distance from origin regulations that are currently on the books. Now is the time for questions. Um, please let me know if you want me to scroll rapidly backwards to a particular slide so that I can talk most efficiently about your question. Um, and thank you to everybody who's listened to this very long and detailed presentation. Hi, Lee, it's Molly. I just wanted to chime in. There was another, um, someone had commented, Amy commented that Arkansas State Parks is currently considering adding a 25 mile radius policy for firewood. Ooh, thank you. That is a great tip. And then there's also some information about West Virginia, um, Berkeley County, that there has not been SLF found, but there has been, or has been found, but there's not yet an infestation. There were a couple of dead adults and just an egg mass. Okay, now was that, here, let me. And that is Nancy, if Nancy wants to add more in her question for us. Here we are. So that was West Virginia, Berkeley. That's interesting. So New York considers it to be a spotted lanternfly infestation from the New York perspective. That's the really tricky thing about this map. 
but perhaps from the West Virginia perspective, you know, you do not yet considering it infestation because you do not believe there's an actual active infestation there, which is the issue with this map is that that subtlety is really hard to pick out. Um, but thank you for that clarification. So, so the, the, <laughs> this is where it gets weird, but the blue zones are the, are infestations in the opinion of New York. It doesn't mean that they're in the opinion of the state that they're in. Um, and firewood cannot be moved into New York if it's in a blue zone. Okay. Of course, firewood can't be moved into New York without heat treatment anyway, but it's a double protection, I suppose. Okay, as of right now, I don't have any other questions in the queue, but if anyone else has questions, we do have a few more minutes, so please get those in as soon as possible. Um, just a reminder that this will be posted on NASMA's YouTube page, and Lee does plan on posting this on the Don't Move Firewood page as well. Yes, and I see, I'm sorry, I must have accidentally closed the chat window, my mistake. So, okay, so there's a question. Can I point to any of the regulations as being more effective than another, or a particular combination that should be looked at as a model? That is such a great question. And um, it is my opinion that the tree species based and pest based regulations are not as effective as firewood based regulations. And one of the biggest issues in this in this realm is that the vast majority of regulations are actually tree based or pest based. They're not firewood based. Firewood as a commodity is the issue, not really a pest. And a lot of firewood can move multiple pests, native, non-native, primary infestation pests like emerald ash borer or secondary infestation pests like uh, European gypsy moth, which can stick to firewood at any time. Um, so my opinion is that regulations that actually look at firewood very specifically as its own entity are the ones that are the most, most effective and the most easily communicated to the public which is how they gain their effectiveness because the public has to understand this and you know regional firewood distributors need to understand it in order to comply as well so that you have both commercial and public participation so i will say let me scroll uh, this page it is my opinion that the most effective quarantines right now are this top bulleted line comprehensive external quarantines these six states Florida, Maine, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont. I will also give partial credit in my <laughs> arbitrary personal opinion to the next four states, um, California, Connecticut, Oregon, and Utah. But I wish those four states had a full comprehensive quarantine that was all firewood, as opposed to having these limited exemptions. Because I think the limited exemptions are very confusing to the public. I think that the model of having a full comprehensive firewood external quarantine allowing for heat treated firewood because that is you know a scientifically sound concept and allows for um, the movement of goods across borders um, but i think that's really the most effective way and i think that the the combination of regulations i don't think is necessarily really helpful because then i think people get mixed messages i think that's why the comprehensive quarantine is really the way to go Okay, Lee, we have another question um, from Kristen Great. Elton. It is a two-parter. So she says, here in New Brunswick, where Emerald Ash Borer was previously identified in Edmonston, in the northwestern part of the province on the border with Maine, Emerald Ash Borer was confirmed in Aramakto, middle of the province, and Moncton, eastern part of the province. Consultations are now in the works for restricted areas, either A, around the individual locations or B, along the Trans-Canada Highway connecting all of those locations. Should firewood regulations be combined with regulations on moving live material? Or wait, sorry, wrong second question. Um, <laughs> if that, like, that doesn't track, we've got extra ones in there. If emerald ash borer has been identified in three different regions of the province, is it everywhere? Should the whole province be regulated? Oh, that's such a good question. I just scrolled the map to look at this and we don't have a lot of new, not all of New Brunswick is on there. Um, I mean, 
I cannot tell you biologically what would be the most effective thing because that actually is not my specialty, but I can tell you from an outreach education and functional standpoint, standpoint that it's a lot more realistic to try to isolate a large part of your province or your whole province, if that's what looks most necessary, than it is to isolate each particular piece. Um, you know, so if I was if I was in charge, I would use what um, if we're looking at the map together that I just brought up, I would use the system that sort of uh, Louisiana has this, you know, the far southern state, it's green on this map. And if you look at Louisiana, they've carved out the part that they think is most problematic and they are isolating it from southern Louisiana. I think if that's feasible within New Brunswick, that would be great. But if it's not feasible, so if it's something more like the situation in um, Arkansas, where there's points in the north, there's parts, points in the south, um, there's adjacent infestation in Oklahoma, um, you know, just protecting that piece from adjacent, adjacent states, or in your case, adjacent provinces might be the most practical. I think the only quarantine that works is one that people can understand and adhere to. Um, and so the science of is it all over in New Brunswick? I, I don't know. Um, but you have to ask yourself, what can you ask people to do and reasonably expect that they will accomplish? And so you will get to your goal. Okay, Lee, we have two more questions because we've only got three minutes left that we're gonna try to do. Okay. So first, and if anyone has any more questions, still post them, we will get those to Lee so we can post those answers later. First one is gonna be from Mike um, Jenkins. It's should firewood regulations be combined with regulations on moving live material, for example, nursery stock, and how often are firewood regulations actually enforced? Okay, well, so whether or not they should be um, combined with nursery stock, my, my opinion would be no. They have extremely different dynamics. Um, firewood it has a lot of side of the road sales. It has a lot, you can self-generate firewood in your own backyard. You can't really do that with nursery stock. I think there's a lot of practical considerations to keeping them separate. Um, the other thing is that the nursery and landscape um, industry is a, a wildly different model than the firewood industry. Firewood industry has no current um, large association, whereas the nursery and landscape association is you know, well established. So there would just be a lot of reasons to keep them separate and regulate them differently. Um, now I'm forgetting what the second question was. Molly, help me out. Um, how often are firewood regulations actually enforced? That depends entirely on the body that is doing the, the enforcement. Um, in some states, they have annual enforcement blitzes. Um, in some campgrounds, they burn all your firewood if you don't say that you, um, you know, bought it from within 10 miles. Um, in other states, there is little to no enforcement. Um, I think that you it, you know to be trite you kind of get what you pay for if you're going to have some clear guidelines and clear enforcement expectations then you will get better adherence um and if you do you know a middle amount of enforcement then you will probably end up with a middle amount of understanding and adherence okay and then this is the last question this is from chris ac in wisconsin is the heat treatment fully effective for all pest species I can't remember the general name or the temperature, unfortunately. 314B, I believe, the highest treatment that is, heat treatment that is. So basically just where, yep, you're on it. All right, so the hottest treatment is the bottom one, um, is 314C. And that one is, you know, it, it destroys basically everything, it, it renders the, firewood, if properly applied, it renders the firewood functionally um, abiotic, essentially. Um, the emerald ash borer standard, as, as we call it, uh, 314A, is the middle of the road standard, and it um, is documented to not create, you know, death in every single pest and every single pathogen. However, it does have a very high effectiveness. Um, so, at some point, you have to ask yourself if you're a regulator or, um, you know, somebody who's looking into these laws in general, how much is enough? And I think 
you know, when you require a very, very high treatment level, you are requiring firewood producers to use a lot of energy um, in the form of whether it's electricity or gas or biomass in order to reach those heat treatment standards for the length of time required to meet the standard. So it's a valid question, how much is enough? Um, if emerald ash borer kills a very, very high percentage of pests, is that enough? And I think the answer to that is gonna depend on what your values are. You know, if you have a particular pest that's of grave concern to your state and it's not dead until the highest standard, then you would value that higher standard as being important. Whereas if um, you don't have any pests that are threatening your trees or your agriculture um, that require that hottest heat treatment, um, then maybe you would just consider the medium one, the T, uh, 314A. Um, T314B with bark on the wood does not kill a sufficient amount of emerald ash borer in many people's opinion. So that lowest treatment, 314B, is generally not used very commonly for firewood. Also, I just noticed I have some mistakes in this slide, which is obviously not, not ideal. Um, the state standards for 314A and 314C examples, those are outdated. There's a couple of mistakes in there. I'm very sorry, I'll have to update that. Those okay. have changed. Yep. Yeah. So unless you have any more to add in at this point, Lee, we will have to close the webinar. It will be posted on both NASMA and Don't Move Firewood's YouTube page again. Um, it should be available on NASMA's by the end of this afternoon or tomorrow morning. And I would assume relatively the same for Don't Move Firewood. So we'll yes. catch you all later. And remember to tune in for the rest of this week's webinars. Thank you very much.